Just thank you. I know what a great organization you have, and I appreciate you letting me give you a little preview of this 2018 cycle and where the RNC is and some of the things that we're seeing and looking at um, going into this election cycle. I think the first question I usually get asked when I'm talking to people is what does the RNC do and what is your role? Uh, I'm more focused on candidates. Those are the things we hear a lot. Uh, and with Reince Priebus in 2012, the RNC really restructured the way we did business. Uh, we recognize that you cannot just expect that people are going to go vote because you're plastering TV with ads and radio with ads that you actually have to engage them. Like Obama did so successfully with the neighborhood model, where he had conversations and, and his volunteers were part of communities and they were talking about the election. And that's what, what, what the RNC has become under rights and now we're continuing that, that program. Um, when I was Michigan chair, we adopted that heavily. We were in offices, we had offices open two years early, we were in neighborhoods two years early, talking to voters, engaging them, not using paid walk, like a lot of uh, a lot of organizations do, actually training our, our grassroots, our natural resource of volunteers, giving them an app, giving them technology, they knock on their neighbor's door, which I do this, I take my children, it's a form of punishment, but it's effective, <laughs> and it builds character, and I say, hey, I'm Rana, I live down the street from you, I really care about this election, can, you, can we talk about some of the things that you're concerned about, and I have dynamic scripting, and I'm getting data points on that voter, and that way, with that data, I can customize for every voter how I'm going to engage with them. One voter's gonna get a Supreme Court message, one's gonna talk, about fiscal conservatism, one's going to talk about uh, energy, it depends on the voter, what we're going to take to them, education, all those different things, health care. So in Michigan we did that, we worked in the field two years early, Hillary Clinton was nowhere to be seen. Now we, we pride ourselves on our data, we buy consumer data, we have 3,000 data points on all 200 million voters. Hillary Clinton had that same access, right? So what was the difference? Why were we so spot on and she wasn't? Well, because she didn't do the ground game, what we did, by having these offices open and knocking doors and calibrating in real time what was happening on the ground with what you were seeing with your analytics that you can buy through data that you purchase. So just a quick example of, of the difference between what, what the RNC is doing and what the DNC was doing with Hillary Clinton is on election night in Michigan, I'm sitting with my Democrat counterpart who became my friend. You know, we see the world very differently, but we were friends like most of us have Democrat friends. And I said, Brandon, what do you have Hil uh, Hillary winning Michigan by tonight? He said, we think she's going to win by five points. In fact, he didn't say thank. We're sure she's going to win by five points. Uh, so confident, so sure of themselves. I said, well, that's interesting because we have Trump winning Michigan by 8,000 votes. So think about your data as your compass. When you think you're going to win by five points, where are you putting that last ad? Where are you going for that last campaign stop? Donald Trump was in Michigan. On election day, he did an overnight rally and started election day in Michigan. You know why? Because he knew that data point of 8,000 votes, and we won by 10,700. So we have just expanded that going into these midterms. We have seen our data be spot on in these special elections. There is more Democrat turnout, absolutely. We're seeing an energy in their base. It's costing us more to turn out our voters right now um, to get them engaged, because sometimes when you win, you think everything's OK, and it's not going to go away. And that's not the case. Um, so we've seen that energy, and we have two different maps in these midterms. You've got the congressional map, the House map, where we know historically the party that holds the White House loses on average 30 seats in that first midterm. We have a 23 seat majority, and we have 24 districts where Hillary Clinton won, where we have incumbents or open seats. So we know that that's the map on the House side. The RNC is investing in over 70 races across the country. We're already on the ground in 27 states. Uh, and just some things to look at on these House races that we've seen in these primaries recently. In California two weeks ago, there are seven races where Hillary Clinton won those districts. In six of those, more Republicans turned out than Democrats. That is very good for us in those primaries. And the Democrats put $10 million into that state to, to push turnout. We put 300000 in to push turnout because we knew how important it was, but we did it more strategically, and we knew exactly which, where our voters were because of our data, and we still beat them. And a bellwether of who wins in the general has always been which party turns out more people in the primary. 
Um, in the past four election cycles, the party that gets more people out in the primary uh, usually wins in the general. So those are some of the things that we're looking at on the House side. California, New York, Pennsylvania will be some of the key states in keeping majority in the House. The Senate side, totally different map. You have 10 states where President Trump won, where we have Democrat incumbents, and an opportunity to flip seat, seats, and then three states where we have to hold, hold our seats, Nevada, Arizona, Tennessee, and then the 10 states where we have Democrat incumbents, some of the states that I think are great opportunities for us, Florida, Indiana, Missouri, North Dakota, West Virginia, then you have Montana, Michigan, Ohio, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. So there are opportunities in this map. Plus there's Minnesota and New Jersey out there too, where we have some really, really strong candidates. So from an RNC perspective, what we're doing to get ready for this election, one, we have raised more money than any political party in history going into a midterm. We hit the 184 million mark. We plan to raise 250 million, half a quarter of a billion dollars to put into this election, which has never happened before. And I think we're absolutely gonna hit that mark. We know it's gonna take those resources. Uh, I never say to people, don't, you know, don't look at our fundraising numbers and say you're done. No, nobody's done. We need all the resources we can get. That's what it's gonna take. Number two, on the data front, we are, we are expanding our data. We're making it quicker so that we can get those analytics onto the ground earlier and make decisions um, in different districts of what we need to do to calibrate our message. We can see if voters are gonna be impacted by certain messages and how that will trend. So that's a huge part of our investment. It's 30% of our overall budget. Uh, third, voter contacts. We've already made seven million voter contacts in the past year and a half. And then the fourth is our volunteer force. In 2016, we had trained over 5,000, just 5,000 volunteers to go into the presidential election. And when I say volunteers, I mean these are the people who are going to knock doors, or they're going to be making phone calls, they're going to be doing all the things you need to do to turn out your vote. This cycle, we've already trained 15,000. And when I say train, it's not an hour-long training and you pop in and you get a few pamphlets and then you leave and go on your way. It's a six-week course where we train these volunteers on our technology, on everything that they're gonna to have to do throughout the campaign. By engaging them in that six week course, they become eligible to be hired as staff, so that's our supply chain, but they are absolutely engaged and over half of them are women. The reason why the party is so important to, to, for the success of our candidates, and I'm a Detroit girl, so I'm gonna use a Detroit analogy. <coughs> candidates with their $2,700 limits cannot invest in the data and the infrastructure at the level that the party can. So we build the road, the party does. We're building it long before the candidates are picked or even set to drive on, on the road. We're building that road, we want a great road. We build the best road we've ever built going into these midterms. Now not all cars are made in Detroit, so the candidates do matter. Um, but the candidates all use our road. And so when we do our job well, we lift the whole ticket, you went up and down the ballot, and you're creating a supply chain for future leaders in your party. It is so important to have a strong party structure and a state party structure, and that is why we've hit the ground running going into 2018. Because look at where our country is right now. We don't hear it on the news, but record unemployment, three million new jobs, wages are up. And not just more jobs and unemployment, you actually have two million uh, more, more people entering the workforce, which wasn't happening under Obama. You had this unemployment numbers, but people were leaving the workforce because they were discouraged and they were leaving. You actually have people entering the workforce. You saw today Gallup said consumer confidence is, is at a high, or the right track is at a high where people are feeling good about the, the direction of this country. You look at ISIS, you look at the judges, you look at the circuit court judges, 21 circuit court judges, which is a record um, on top of Neil Gorsuch. Uh, our military is being funded. We did the Veterans Choice and Accountability Act, taking care of our veterans. Good things are happening. And my final message would be is the Democrats have made a decision. We're not going to work with this president. It's very clear. It's resist. It's obstruct. It's no, no, no. That, that's the hand they're playing. We don't want to work with him at all because we think we can take that into the midterms and gain seats and, and, and create a domino effect towards 2020. The best way we can get bipartisanship in Washington is to reject their message and have Republicans return to the majority. Because if that strategy doesn't work for them going into November, then they will have to retool and maybe decide to work with this president. Things like immigration, 
when the president puts forward a deal for 1.8 million DACA individuals, three times more than President Obama put forward, with coupling better border security, ending chain migration, and going to a merit-based immigration system, that is very reasonable, especially when we just found out that 6.7 million jobs are open in this country and we only have 6.3 million people to fill them. We need immigration, but we want to do it legally, but we can't do that unless we shift to a merit-based system. And if we, if we can take care of these DACA individuals, which I think there is bipartisan support over that, we can get that done. Democrats don't want to do it. You know why? They want it as a white issue going into this election. And that's just a fact. If we come out of this election with the majorities, they will sit down and work with this president. He is more than willing to sit down with Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi. So those are the things that we're focusing on. And I just want to end um, on a personal note, because Bill mentioned my grandfather. Every Sunday, my grandpa, George Romney, would have us for dinner and talk about the importance of this country and how blessed we are to live here, and that we can't take it for granted, and the importance of getting involved. And sometimes we would fight, and sometimes we would leave the table, and I thought that was normal. Um, and that still happens in our family. Uh, but it's true. We, have the, we live in the greatest country on Earth, and it's something worth fighting for. And I truly feel like we are on a path towards prosperity that we haven't seen in this country over the past eight years. And it's a good place, and I want to see that continue. So it's worth uh, those 651,000 sky miles so that we can make a difference and make our country better. If you want to bump it up, that's fine. Do you have any like special controls? Or no, that's illegal. I'm just kidding. Anyway, it's, this is a country worth, worth fighting for. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for being in it. We're going to need all hands on deck to win this election. It is that important. Everybody said 2016 was the most important election. I actually think this is equally, if not more important, because we're heading into 2020 and redistricting. We are shaping our nation. And do we want our nation to look like how the founders intended, or do we want to reshape it into something that looks like Europe? And that's a really important question that we're facing. So thank you so much. God bless each of you, and God bless the United States.